Hey, it's Mike here, and today, five nutritional myths that a lot of people believe. Do you believe them? Are you excited to find out? I am. All right, so some of these myths are super widespread, and some of them are just more interesting to me, and maybe you know some of these myths, but I bet there's gonna be something in this video that you didn't know, so stay tuned. And I will mention that this is a Thrive Partnership video. Thrive is an online marketplace with prices that are about 25 to 50% lower than retail, and we'll cover more about them in a bit, but first, let's get to myth number one. Mike needs a haircut. Actually, that's not a myth or nutritional. It's true. All right, now we're actually gonna get to myth number one, which is a pretty widely accepted fact, which is that you have no control over fat. In other words, it's just genetics. There are a lot of people who are overweight that just look around at their family and see, oh, well, I'm meant to be this way, I'm meant to be overweight, but is it really genetics? Well, according to this study that looked at obesity genes, only about 2.7% of the variation in BMI and body mass index was attributable to gene differences. So that's maybe five pounds for somebody when the average person in the US is about 20 to 25 pounds overweight. So it's less about the obesity genes that are being passed on within families and more about the the habits, the lifestyle, the diet that is being inherited. And this is actually pretty inspirational. It means you have control. And from the lead author, they told Time, quote, no magic genes change anything. You have to bite the bullet and eat a bit less or be more active. And you don't even need to try and eat less calories in particular. Looking to the Broad study out of New Zealand, they claimed that it was the most effective weight loss diet program for obese people at six and 12 months out of anything that didn't mandate exercise or calorie restrict. They were allowed to eat as much as they want and it was a whole food vegan diet. Super effective weight loss. And one final point on the gene thing, if you're looking at diet groups that have roughly the same genetic makeup, Western vegans were the only ones to average in the normal BMI. Vegetarians didn't and meat eaters did not as well. The main difference between vegans and other diets is that the other diets are eating way more animal fat, which is more calorie dense and way less fiber. In fact, according to the Institute of Medicine, about 97% of people in the US aren't getting enough fiber and fiber tells you when you're full. All right, moving on, myth number two. That detoxing is healthy, particularly that it works and that it's something you should do periodically. The detox industry is possibly one of the worst industries in the world. I was once in Ecuador and everybody was doing these ionic foot baths, which allegedly sucked black toxins out of your feet and made the water black because that's how many toxins you have in your soul. As this Harvard article mentions, that black water is just from corroding electrodes and you just paid a lot of money to watch that happen. Scam. In terms of diet, the industry is ripe with cleanses and starvation diets and various detox regimens and anecdotal claims, but from the US government, quote, the FDA and FTC have taken action against several companies selling detox slash cleansing products because they contained illegal, potentially harmful ingredients were marketing using false claims that they could treat serious diseases. Perhaps the main point is, as this study mentions, quote, to the best of our knowledge, no randomized controlled trials have been conducted to assess the effectiveness of commercial detox diets in humans. Chinchillas though, they benefit from a good detox. But what if you're just doing maybe like a harmless cleanse like a juice fast? Well, we have to look at our liver and how our liver detoxes the the vast majority of all toxins in our body and it does so through dumping it in the small intestines and sending it out on the fiber train through your body. So a juice cleanse, a fiberless detox might be the one time that your liver cannot actually do its job. Those toxins might just recirculate and the same thing happens with hormones. They can recirculate, so it's worth knowing that. So next time you get detox acne, it might just be a buildup of hormones that couldn't exit your body. Just an idea. Now, I know there's somebody out there who's like, Mike, if it's all about the liver, I got an idea. I'm just gonna do a liver cleanse. I had a friend who once did a liver cleanse and he swore that he was pooping out liver stones and that he was cleansing his liver super hard. Well, the reality is from this Lancet article that actually looked at the composition of those stones, turns out it was just from mixing olive oil and acid, particularly lemon juice in the small intestines, which led to soap stones. You're pooping soap, man. It's just soap. There's a soap opera you don't want to watch. <laughs> Perhaps most importantly, the force that drives people to do detoxes is probably not actually toxins themselves. It's more the ongoing dietary choices that people make and lifestyle choices as well. Hello, welcome to Dina's Detox Talks for 364 days of the year. I have a steady diet of vodka and bacon, but day 365, I do a detox. It all evens out. It all, it offsets every horrible other thing I do. Hit a child with your car, detox. Got drunk and ate some marbles? Just do a detox. Went on a bender and fell face first into a crude oil spill? Do a detox. 
If your diet is the equivalent of punching yourself in the face three times a day, yes, you are gonna feel better doing a detox, and there actually are toxins in the diet that are good to remove. For example, 95% of persistent organic pollutants get into the body through the diet, through animal fat. And there are obesogenic chemicals, chemicals that help you store fat, such as tributyltin, which can be found in unhealthily high levels in various fish. And then there's a liver toxin known as alcohol. So instead of exposing yourself to all of the toxins 99% of the time, and then detoxing, you can just eat all of the plants and get exposed to way less toxins. And many plants have good effects on your liver, as this study mentions, including brassicas, like broccoli. All right, next myth, myth number three, and that is, is the complete protein myth, particularly that you have to eat your protein sources as complete proteins, particularly from animals. This is sort of two myths in one. Firstly, that you need to eat animal proteins to get complete proteins. And secondly, that if you aren't eating animal proteins, that you have to strategically combine proteins in order to get a complete profile. The first part that you need to eat animals to get complete protein is a myth that is alive and well. A quick Google search will yield this quote. In order to be considered complete, a protein must contain all nine of these essential amino acids in roughly equal amounts. Yes, meat and eggs are complete proteins, and beans and nuts aren't. Yeah, look at this crappy protein food. You know, see how it's a little bit lower in valine compared to other amino acid? Oh wait, that's beef. <laughs> and here's black beans, maybe a little bit lower on methionine, but nothing really missing here. Yet one is complete nonsense. But I wanna give some authors of that article credit here because what wasn't included in the preview is this quote. Most dietitians believe that plant-based diets contain such a wide variety of amino acid profiles that vegans are virtually guaranteed to get all of their amino acids with very little effort. In other words, you don't need to focus on protein combining, which is a myth that was popularized by Frances Moore LePay in her book, Diet for a Small Planet in the 70s, which she then later came out in a revised version and said was actually not true. That being said, no, you still aren't gonna get enough protein on an orange juice only diet. Here's 2000 calories of orange juice. Not cutting it, actually more than I thought there'd be, but not cutting it. And just for fun, here is 2,000 calories of tofu versus 2,000 calories of orange juice. We're learning. And the final nail in the coffin from Wikipedia, quote, the terms complete and incomplete are outdated in relation to plant protein. You heard it from the most legitimate source on earth. Actually, don't cite Wikipedia. Actual nail in the coffin from this study, vegans have higher levels of free blood protein than omnivores do, and that is likely from not having to make all those inflammation proteins. Now I could ramble on about a bunch of bodybuilders like Jahina Malik, who's been vegan for life, has never consumed animal protein, and is an IFBB professional bodybuilder. But let's talk about Thrive Market for a quick second. Now that you aren't deathly afraid of failing to combine proteins, you can do a stress-free food search on Thrive Market by simply checking the vegan box, and that'll give you just vegan search results. Another plus, there's free shipping on orders over $50, and just to save you time, sadly, this is only available in the US currently. Finally, they just got their own oat milk in, which is super unprocessed, and I'm super stoked to try. And you can find my link in the description for some extra savings. But for now, let's move on back to another myth, myth number four. This one's really obscure, and you probably didn't believe it, but for some reason, it just bothers me. And that is that serotonin that you make in your gut makes it to your brain and makes you happier. Once they discovered that about 90% of the body's serotonin is produced in the gut, and there's a connection between depression and gut health, people went crazy. Hey, your gut is your second brain, and the gut-brain axis was born. And don't get me wrong, I find this stuff super interesting, and I probably will do a video on it at some point, but does that gut serotonin actually make you happier? Well, the language in this study, in the Journal of Clinical Psychopharmacology and Neuroscience, would lead you to believe that it does, with, quote, Gut microorganisms are capable of producing and delivering neuroactive substances such as serotonin. Yes, serotonin is technically a neuroactive substance, but serotonin made in the gut or that makes it into your bloodstream in some way cannot cross the blood-brain barrier where you would actually use it to be happy. This is why in order to raise serotonin or make serotonin at all, we need precursors like tryptophan and why people take serotonin reuptake inhibitors instead of taking serotonin directly. Don't get me wrong, all of that other serotonin outside your brain and your body does have a purpose. It's called peripheral serotonin and it helps with things like metabolism, insulin, etc. In the end, while there do appear to be some interesting communications between your gut and your brain via the vagus nerve, which have been demonstrated in some very cruel animal experiments, that serotonin you're making in your gut, 
not really making you happier. Okay, last myth, number five, carbs make you fat. In particular, carbs are responsible for the obesity epidemic. We will see. This is potentially one of the most widespread beliefs about diet that there is. It's carbophobia everywhere. But if you've watched my channel before, you've probably seen this study, which massively overfed women sugar, refined sugar, and whether they were obese or lean, 90 to like 96% of the fat that they stored was from fat they ate. Fat in the mouth, fat in the pouch. I don't know what that was. So the researcher's conclusion was that in the scheme of things, sugar intake doesn't contribute greatly to fat storage. And there is a bit of a nuance here, and that is that while you are storing fat from fat, the likelihood of you storing more and more fat is determined by how many excess calories you eat and whether they are excess carbs or excess fat, you will still store more fat. However, it is super important to note that because fat is over twice as calorie dense per gram as sugar, you're a heck of a lot more likely to be storing more fat when you eat more fat. Let's zoom out because another way to practically look at this is through the epidemiology. Looking to the Okinawans, they traditionally ate 85% of their calories from carbohydrates, which is super high. At this point, they had no issues with obesity and were super long lived, but as time went on, they westernized in their diet and became the most obese area of Japan. They now ironically consume more fat than the rest of Japan and have an obesity epidemic that some researchers have referred to as the second battle of Okinawa. It's that bad. So as they ate less and less carbs, they became more and more obese. Let that sink in. And back to the Broad study, that super effective whole food vegan weight loss study, that was also a high carb diet. It was all whole carbs and they lost more weight than any other comparable trial. All right, that's it for the myths, but I do want to mention that I will be at the Sonoma County Veg Fest on August 18th in Santa Rosa, California, and I will be playing my Jeopardy game at 1 p.m., so if you're around there, definitely stop by. Finally, let me know if you knew all these myths, if it was all old news, or if you learned anything. If you did learn anything, give it a like. And the last point of all, definitely go and check out Thrive Market. My link is in the description below. And that way you can save some extra money and get a bunch of good food sent directly to you. And if you also buy a membership, they will buy another membership for a low income person. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to subscribe. And I already said like, so see you next time.